Hello? Okay. Okay, I guess we're ready to start, everyone. Um, my name is Jeff Stansfield. I want to thank you all for uh, coming to our panel. I really appreciate it. Um, I realize that Digital Hollywood is a nice place and has a lot of panels, and I appreciate you sitting in our panel. And I hope you learn something. If you have any questions, uh, we'll be around afterwards to answer questions. We'll also I'll do a Q&A at the end of our panel. Um, we're going to start by introducing, um, I'll introduce myself and, and then and, and what the panel is about and what our objectives are. And then I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves and talk about who they are and what they do. Maybe give you understanding and, a, and an idea of so what, what, what they do and how they can get information to you that you want to get. And then we'll jump into some uh, topics that I have questions on, and then we'll go, and we'll go from there. Um, my name is Jeffrey Stansfield. I'm the owner and founder of Advantage Video Systems. We're one of the industry's leading systems integration companies, which means we build all the technology for the motion picture and entertainment industry. We've built over 250 TV stations, brick and mortar. We've worked with companies, Disney and HBO and CBS, and on everything from post-production to production to asset management to archiving. Uh, we are one of the largest builders of video podcasting studios in the United States. We've built more podcasting studios and stages than almost anybody around. Um, and we've recently launched, uh, last year, our own TV network, uh, iLaunch TV, where we have 16, 16 channels and growing. Uh, we're on Amazon Fire Stick, Apple TV, Roku. We're on DirecTV, Comcast, Dish Network. Many other, many other platforms out there. We're uh, built into most of the TVs out there, Samsung, Zenith, uh, LG, and so on. Uh, we, we broadcast to 160 countries and uh, have access to 500 million viewers. So that's very good. We also have on local channels, like local channel 30 and 6 in Los Angeles and Chicago and New Orleans. So we're around there. So Advantage Video Systems and, uh, and uh, I launch TV with all our different networks. Uh, if you have more information, we have flyers and we can talk about it. Uh, one thing I want to say, if anybody is planning to go to the NAB conference in, in April, uh, we have codes to get a free pass. It helps us out if you use our code, so we would really appreciate it if you did that and pass it around. I have, I'll have the codes available up, up here for you. So the idea of the panel um, is producing video for OTT and social media. And we want to talk about some of the experiences that our, that our panelists have had in producing video for, for, for the OTT platform to be put on a con their own content delivery network or on their own uh, other platforms that they have. Uh, they also want to talk about their experiences in producing video. We have a wide, wide range of people from st standard production to uh, VR and 360 production people on, on, on our panel. Uh, and we have some people in traditional broadcasting as well. Um, and so I want to get into have them. And so I'll, I'll start um, with uh, you to introduce yourself. All right. My name is Ben Gans. I'm the president of Vigo Pictures. This is actually my first panel ever. Pretty excited. Um, you may not have heard of Vigo Pictures. We're two years old. Before that, I was in the TV world. I started off with eight seasons of American Idol, first in traditional production, then switched over to digital side with Fox when all they're unscripted. And so now I started a company that deploys digital teams to networks and relating to OTT. We're really helping Kevin Hart launch his um, Laugh Out Loud network with Lionsgate. Great, thank you. Han, oh, uh, how, how, you want to give uh, contact information now or you want to do it later? Sure, add Vigo Ben on Instagram. Add me right now, I'll follow you back. Okay, <laughs> so Han, you want to go next? Uh, my name is Hugh Ho. I'm a YouTuber and Instagrammer. I run the YouTube channel called Creator Up on YouTube. Uh, I am focused on VR 360 virtual reality production on the live action side, not the gaming side. Uh, that's my specialty. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Great, thank you. Ty, what about you? Uh, good afternoon, I've seen you, uh, Jeffrey. Good seeing you again. Yeah. I'm Ty Green, I'm the founder of the Missing Channel Media Group. We are in broadcast TV distribution. Um, we currently have four TV networks, about to launch our fifth one on AVOD, on Comcast, Direct, Dish, and uh, we're launching the first, our newest edition, we're launching the first cannabis broadcast TV network in North America called 420 Entertainment TV. You can add it on your IG at 420 ETV. Thank you. Great, thank you. Aaliyah? Great. 
Uh, my name is Aaliyah J. Daniels. I am the COO and co-founder of Revry. Revry is a digital streaming network uh, for the LGBTQ community. We're available on Apple TV, iOS, Android, Roku. We have linear channels on Pluto and Zumo. Um, and yeah, so you can find us at Revry TV on all social. Great. Cool. Uh, my name is Ryan James. I'm taking over for Darren Cross. I'm from Unreal. I'm one of the co-founders. Unreal is a video distribution and monetization tool and platform. Uh, we power apps for uh, brands like uh, World Poker Tour, uh, Popcorn Flicks, Nosy, America's Funniest Home Videos, etc. Um, you can find us at unreal.me and my email is ryan at unreal.me. Cool. Hi, I'm Neil Davis. I'm the Chief Business Officer at UCAS Global. Uh, UCAS Global uh, not only builds OTT platforms for major media brands, uh, but also we are one of the largest distributors of premium video content outside the United States. We um, power about 1.5 billion eyeballs on a monthly basis in Latin America, Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, and China. That's very cool. Well, th thank you all for introductions. So I wanted to start the panel with a couple of questions. We'll start with production and we'll move into distribution. So um, for production people, uh, and that's our early our panelists right here, um, we want to talk about um, some of the challenges that you have. Uh, you know, we have 360, something that's pretty much predominantly 360, and then we have something that's predominantly uh, 2D and, and standard production. So what are some of the different challenges that come out, uh, and Ty, you do some production too, uh, uh, for, um, Shooting video for YouTube and social and and and, and o OTT platforms that kind of differ from traditional. Traditional, we have these big crews and we have all these, and we have and we have a big bigger budgets and we have all that stuff. But um, so, what are some of the challenges that you've seen, you've overcome, and what are some of the things in the future that you're seeing that a future that, that you want to see in in, our, in in the production technology? I mean, the technology is all there right now, and it can be done on a phone, or it can be done with the same equipment used to make broadcast TV. The problem right now is that everyone wants the broadcast TV look, and they don't want to pay for it, OK? Right. Like, everyone wants the world, and then they want to squeeze every money, and they, they, they get aggressive. Like, how could you charge that much money? Well, that's how much production needs to cost when we made nice things. Well, it's YouTube. I don't get it, you know? And so it's really just convincing people to spend money. Or right. not. Don't call me. I don't care. But don't ask me to do something that I don't pay. <laughs> so, so I have to be the evil guy. So I'm on the other end. So I, I am a on the ground YouTuber. I make all my content. And I actually coaching people from the YouTube side to make all their content. Uh, I, I help create a, from as small as 5,000 subscribers all the way up to 2 or 3 million subscribers. Uh, they, they actually, all they're filming it is the camera right, right there. It's a Sony Alpha 7. Mark II with uh, DJI gimbal. That's all they do. They, they go out, they go travel, they vlog, and people love it. And to be honest, uh, I think it's also kind of a generation thing. So uh, most people around North America, like under 25, they consume most of their content nowadays on their mobile phone, which is YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, most of them don't have cable network. Their TV is actually streaming from YouTube, uh, so, so they got a TV. Uh, so they pay for YouTube right, and get all the stuff. So, so it, it's a different world. So to me, because I'm dealing with creators like that on the ground, and there are a lot of them, like literally everybody from, from high school all the way to college, they're making their own content. They need to have a way to make content really fast. I produce literally one video a day. Having a crew is actually slowing me down. So having a, a reliable setup, easy, uh, Setup is actually very important as a content creator if you are really want to get into the social space. Uh, unfortunately, speed is the first thing. Quality comes seconds. And quality is mean a lot of stuff. Like, yeah, you can have production quality. You can shoot something red, uh, which you can do it in uh, YouTube space. But you can have a good content just with your mobile phone. That's a phone, by the way. It's not a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? What, what was your question? Well, we were talking about. 
So we were talking about you know the, the, the level, the, the technology we use today. Like for instance, he says you know shooting on iPhones, but iPhones are shoot on variable frame rates, and real cameras. Not to say the iPhone's not a real camera, but it shoots on a real camera sh like the Sony out there shoots on a on a on a specific frame rate. So you have you 1080, 29, 197. Mm -hmm. That's there. But it, you have a iPhone, and you have some and that technology. Yes, it has a great lens on it and a decent a, a decent enough lens on it, but you're shooting at a variable frame rate, and it may be okay for some, but in today's tech, in today's environments of broadcasting, we need much higher standards because people are people know when they look at something that's lower quality, something that's higher quality. People can tell even if they don't say that. So, my, Ty, my question was, uh, what uh, what advance what technology have you seen that, that's different from traditional broadcasting to producing video for the internet, for YouTube, for social media? What I like is that Sony, I think that was a Sony that was walking yes, around. Yes, FF7. Yeah, um, 4K typically, yeah. um, which you can um, dial back if you're using for any of the social media sites mm -hmm. that need to stream content very quickly. Yes. I like the fact that the individuals that are the independents are shooting at 4K, so when they choose to do broadcasts, it's a very easy to, um, uh, as far as a look, yeah. Now, as far as quality, in, in our side, because we answer to our advertisers, they want to make sure that this either is branded content or this piece of content is going to fit that desired audience or reach or demographic that they're trying to reach. Um, but yeah, that is the biggest change I've seen. I like that the independents are now shooting with higher or better cameras, lenses. Yeah. Yeah. Really so, well. Because so, so, so before it was less, you know, 1080p or less. And now they're up to you know two k. Well, do we go. really need? Well, that's another question. So, do we really need four k? I mean, we can't really stream four k really mm -hmm. because the bandwidth's not there. There's, there's no you know. We can next year. Yeah. Five G. So, uh, <laughs> but do we really need to go that? Uh, uh, there's plenty of really beautiful um, and good 1080 products out there. Uh, do we really need four k? Well, if you could do it cheaply, why not? You know? Yeah, yeah. So my my thing is uh, there's a camera coming out called ZCam E2. Uh, alongside with the Black Magic Pocket, which is a 4K raw camera, it costs a thousand dollars. The E2 can shot 120 frame 4K uh, in ProRes raw. So the quality come out that thing is can comparable with like a red camera, and I saw it. And the technology is getting cheaper and cheaper, and creator can get into this camera for spending less than three thousand mm -hmm. dollars. To me, technology is not the thing. It's actually what, as a creator, should focus on the content. The storytelling. I mean, broadcasts have their format that make them become broadcast, become so engaging, and people want to watch like HBO instead of some YouTuber talking about their life. But there's other people who love to watch YouTuber talking about life, different story. <laughs> uh, so, so I think that technology is always gonna be advanced. Stuff gonna be always cheaper, and quality gonna always be increasing. Like in my world, VR, we need 8K by 8K stereoscopic minimum. We're talking about 16K. Uh, yeah. Mm. Oh, anyway. I just want to bridge the gap between both of their worlds. It's right, so it's like you'll have these major brands, your Procter and Gamble's, and they'll say we want six Instagram videos. And it's like yeah, you could go make it with nothing, but they expect a sort of it's quality centered with, for you know brand safety. And then you show them, okay, well we have to use the old broadcast equipment, and you show them the bill. They're like, whoa, 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 what's going on here, right? And it's like okay, then want to shoot with the phone? Well, that's not good enough. So it's like how can you do that for less? I think that's a challenge because all the tech is there, right? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Gotcha. So um, another question is, you know, so we have all these people producing content. We have millions and millions of people producing content every day. Um, so what is it that somebody can do to, to make their content stick out for you guys? And so you guys will want to buy this. And then what are you looking for um, them to provide extra? Because you can shoot a video, but then there's a lot of other things that, you, that, that are needed in the social media and OTT platform, mm -hmm. such as metadata and, and, you know, and stuff like that that's needed. So what is it you guys are looking for at, that you can tell these people, if I'm, if I'm gonna buy your content, what is it that I need you to deliver to me? What can I, how can I do to stand out? Absolutely. I mean, for us, it's it's about the quality of the story. The story always is always has to be, you know, number one. Is it authentic? Are you telling your story? Are you telling me a story that I'm not seeing everywhere else? That's incredibly important for us and for our brand. But the quality of the production has to be there too. Otherwise, it's distracting from the story. And you know, 
the technology is there. It's, it's, it's become so much more affordable for creators to get their hands on products that can allow for them to shoot and, you know, get good sound and get good lighting. It's not like it used to be, you know? And so honestly, the production value, that's like a no brainer. It's really for us, it's about the story and about there being authenticity in what you're, what you're saying, about there being, you know, an opportunity for just something different to be seen. And then with regards to the additional information or, you know, additional, you know, things for us, it's about, are you willing to be a part of the process? Are you willing to not just drop off your content and walk away and then that's it? And hopefully, you know, you guys do the best you can. No, I want you to be a part of the process. I want you to engage your community. I want you to tell your story from maybe a different perspective. Let's do an Instagram takeover where you talk about the process of creating your content. Don't just walk away from it. I want you to be, you know, involved in all aspects. I agree uh, with a lot of that. I think it comes down to having uh, a strategy to create strong content on a regular basis. Is it going to be episodic? And are you going to be uh, pumping out new content on a regular basis? And where is that content going to live? Um, I, I think uh, as far as just getting back to what they were saying earlier, we're seeing a lot of great content getting created and pumped out on cameras like that and on mobile phones. And I've seen iPhone commercials and shorts that I've shown to really amazing producers and directors and they didn't know it was shot on an iPhone until I showed them a little end card at the end that said shot on iPhone. So uh -huh. I think there's a big stigma out there around this lower budget stuff and we're gonna see uh, more high level creative people embracing it moving forward. Um, the, the tools are out there to create high quality content and drive costs down to produce it. Um, I think it really just comes down to your audience and what you're creating. If you're doing live events and you need switchers, and it, it's a totally different story. Um, but if if you're doing OTT and social, it's okay to have lower budget productions and still reach an audience in a in a powerful way. And I'm at all the way on the other side of the trough in terms of okay, now I've produced this with either an iPhone or a Sony or or whatever camera and I've invested a chunk of capital, and then how do I make money right now? If I'm only interested in showing it in front of my family after watching my bar mitzvah video, it's a different story. But if I'm looking to, if I'm looking to raise money to, right, there's, there's go out to in and out Burger on Friday night money, and there's like real, I wanna make a living at this money, mm -hmm. and there's a whole different process there. It's mm -hmm. really challenging for an individual content creator with one piece a day, two pieces a day. There has to be an aggregation. There needs to be really dramatic metadata, as you talked about earlier, because yeah. search and discovery is becoming unbelievably important. Yeah. What's now becoming really important is closed captioning, which I know is a real pain in the ass, <laughs> but in terms <laughs> of, and by the way, if, if your stuff is on YouTube and, you, and it's on closed caption and you want to bring it someplace else, you don't get the closed caption file. Right. No, you so you need your own closed caption file to be able to distribute that stuff elsewhere. So there's a whole bunch of things you have to think about down the line. That's when you come to us, we'll, we'll do that for you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so uh, talking about making money, uh, let's let's oh. get into because that's important. That's why we all produce that's this. Probably, yeah. <laughs> now we're talking. Uh, one, one second. We'll do questions a little bit later. Okay. Thank you. So, um, so in talking about how, what are what are some what are some we all know that, I mean there's some additional ways so like Ty with his network is probably you he produces he has he does his shows and he, and he sells ad, ad, ads on 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 his network and then there's other ways of monetizing videos and making money so what are some of the ways out the, the ways out there that are that are being more that are being successful today in, in monetizing video well there's been very few success stories, right? So, <laughs> so you've got your SVOD success stories, which are you can count on a couple of fingers, and you've got your AVOD success stories, which you can count on a couple of fingers. Um, and so what seems to be more prevalent now is you're going to ride both horses because riding one horse or the other just puts all your money in one basket. And, and you know, on the AVOD side, you're competing for the last 25 cents that Facebook or Google are leaving on the table. On the SVOD side, you're competing with the couple of dollars left after I pay my Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, whatever it is, subscription. And so, so maybe the best thing right now is to compete for both fractions mm -hmm. rather than one or the other. Okay. So we have a yeah. scenario. Oh, go ahead. 
Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I mean, that's exactly what we're doing. We have both an SVOD and an AVOD service. We initially started with SVOD and we re recently just relaunched in September with an AVOD service. And one of the things that's really important is that we have a very specific community, a very targeted community, a community that advertisers do want to reach. So while traditionally, yes, other AVOD plays, you're going to see that 25 cents, we're getting premium CPMs because this is a specific audience that advertisers want to target and this is exactly where they are. So that's, that's the first thing with regards to AVOD. With regards to subscription, it's a similar sort of approach. Um, most of our audience is Gen Z millennials. They're used to YouTube. They're not used to paying for subscriptions. So for us, we've created a model which allows for them to get the, get in the door, you know, through AVOD, but with subscription, it's more for a super fan. Oh, you want additional content. You want tickets to community events. You want to be able to get merch. You want to be able to really immerse yourself in the experience 100%. That's what SVOD is for on our, at least for us. That's the way that we've positioned ourselves. So we have a Christian audience for one of the networks. One is beauty, which is, and then the other one's brand is cannabis. So for the Christian audience, it's 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 very it's hyper focused on around that message of what they're doing. So we do AVOD, SVOD, and even TVOD mm -hmm. across all the different platforms as well as TV. And then we have a four prong thing that we use for every piece of content: curation, personalization, community, and commerce. We are not just selling the ads or, or SVOD, TVOD, we actually sell products around this whole idea of community. We have actual events around yeah. the actual thing that's going on, whether it be at a playhouse in some state or there's an actual event. And so that we are curating and personalizing that audience from the ground up to actually push out and you know influencers or individuals who want to come and support you know, a, a bunch of content. We might have a weekend of just films around a particular subject matter with people in a particular town or city. And physically on the ground, actually selling, you know, t-shirts, hats, whatever, things that, so people can take a part, be a part of that as opposed to just taking the DVD or whatever, the digital file with them. And it's been working out quite well. That's good. So let's let's talk about that a little bit more. Let's go into branding a little bit. How, you know, because you know we have all these ways of making uh, we have these these, these traditional ways of making money, but it all it all wraps around how can you brand? Like Reverie has a great brand that they've developed okay. over years, and they and they have their brand. So how do you how does somebody to develop a brand on 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 their on their platform and and um, and. And, and what what are some what are some success stories maybe and I know that Ty you have some success stories and and and, and to a, to an extent uh, you, you shooting your 360 you have your certain kind of branding so tell me let's discuss a little about branding maybe you can talk about that a little bit more. Sure. I mean, I, I would just say for us, it, again, it, it just goes back to authenticity and it comes back to being community driven. So we are within the community. We're not just sort of back away, you know, we're queer and allied founded, we, most of our employees are queer, like we are a part of the community authentically, and so that brand automatically re like represents that. And I think one of the most important things is that the community would recognize almost immediately if you were just like, ooh, a money play, let's do it. Like that's not what this is about. This is about the fact that there wasn't, you know, a media, um, oper there, there was a media opportunity where we could actually represent the entire queer spectrum, which is not something that's generally been done before. And so that was an opportunity for us, and that was something that the community, you know, believed in and they are supporting us with. And so through that, we were able to create a brand that's now become synonymous with that. Uh, I've been involved with one of the best executions of branded content that I've ever seen. And I got lucky because I've been dealing with Kevin Hart, and he's an incredible talent. And first of all, think about what a network is, okay? A network's only job is to deliver eyeballs to brands. That's it. They make content to get eyeballs there. That's the only point. For so a lot of people have been cutting out the middlemen, right? And especially as a production company, that makes a lot of sense. Just go to the brands. Brands can be their own networks. But what we did was we took an existing talent, Kevin, and we, we uh, I only executed, I didn't develop the show, but they developed a show around him where he was a Lyft driver, okay? And that, that series got 40 million views organically. It got, I don't know, 1.6 million social engagements, and it created like a 40% brand lift for them. And everyone won because it was good content. It wasn't ad, it was just funny. Um, around beauty, um, because we, we focus on um, art, autos, beauty, fashion, and luxury. We do all of Fashion Week in New York, London, Milan, Paris, Tokyo, Dubai, 
Hong Kong, um, which is a rapid, if anyone understands the beauty market, mm -hmm. it's a very rapid um, um, marketplace that likes to spend money. And so having brands advertise or promote or sponsorships, it hasn't been a challenge actually. They want to have a, another lane to actually promote their products beyond whatever they're doing. And I think that when you build a, a niche uh, streaming service or, or niche distribution platform, you open yourselves up to those brands wanting to, to get in and, and reach that, that, what you were saying, sort of very targeted community. Um, so I, I think that when it comes to just branding in general, niche is a good thing when you're launching an OTT streaming service. He mentioned earlier that it's hard to succeed at all in the space. Whether you're SVOD or you're AVOD, it's very tough. Um, but I, we've seen more success with people launching very niche community focused apps to sort of take advantage of that leftover two or three dollars after people have paid for Netflix and the other big services. Um, so we, we power an equestrian service that performs mm -hmm. really well. Um, we power High Times TV in the cannabis space mm -hmm. that performs very well. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, we power, we launched a Halloween streaming service called Halloween Flix, and just organically over a month, it's number nine in Fire TV store for free apps. And so just like going after these niche, passionate communities, whether it's around a holiday, whether it's around um, a, a certain sport or vertical, I think that is where you're gonna actually be able to, to break in and get people to pull out their their credit card and pay for things, and it's where you're gonna be able to take advantage of brands that are looking to, to reach this passionate audience. It's, it is unbelievably expensive to build a brand in the general market space. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, just, it, it, it just becomes this thing you gotta constantly throw money on. Um, and maybe instead of building a brand, again, much easier, I agree, in, in, in the niche space, but even, right, there's very, a lot of the niches that uh, the, the, the greatest propensity for revenue have now been staked out. So it's really hard to find your lane. So maybe initially, if you were building something in the cannabis space, affiliating with a brand like 420 TV or somebody like that, right, and being, for lack of better words, parasitic until you've gotten not only enough content, but your brand kind of stands aside and then you spin out maybe is a better strategy than throwing a whole bunch of money into social media and marketing and influencer and everything else like that because it's just never going to be enough. I'd rather, I'd rather draft on what 420 is doing in the space and then break off once I have enough. I'm in a unique space with the 420 piece. I have about 25 plus 100 brands consistent, consistently hitting us up trying to advertise on the space. So it's got to the place where I actually have more brands wanting to buy inventory that I have content to put there. Well, inventory. cannabis is interesting just because yeah. typical brands don't know if they want cannabis ads running on their stuff yet. Oh, so they're yeah. sort of like blacklisted. Oh, yeah. Things like YouTube. Right now, YouTube kicked off all they the sure. cannabis brands. Yeah, so Facebook, Facebook just allowed Facebook, it. So every, yeah. Yeah. Wow. everyone's trying to figure out what to do in that space. So we figure, why not be a place to, yeah. you know, I learned a long time ago in business school, um, make it easy for people to give you money. Yeah, and it's, it's like I like this guy. Yeah, yeah. It's not <laughs> just just make it easy. I mean, um, uh, everyone else has been kicked off, and it took me two years to get a deal with Comcast, and they finally said and acquiesced and said yes. But it's the anti stoner. It's it's more Bloomberg, CNN, than than you know Cheech and Chong. But uh, <laughs> but uh, it's still um you know that we see the space, and now we're partnering with all the festivals in California to cover them. The music festivals, Cannabis mm -hmm. Cup. Emerald Cup, yada, 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 so. So uh, I think all the panelists here already covered the brand side. Uh, I actually want to like come from different angle as a creator side. So if you're like me, you are individual creator. Uh, actually, what type one, what you just mentioned, one thing that as an individual creator really important is are you brand safe? Uh, I mean, on YouTube side, on Facebook side, it's actually really important that you have a track record of brand safe. If you are not, you either get demonetized or Google will not favor your brand deal. So uh, as you know, like as an individual YouTuber or creator, the only way to make money is not your AdSense money. I mean, that will not supply anything. Probably you earn $1,000 a month, that's it. 
So most of income is actually come from brand collab or created income. So for brand collab, brand, first thing we look at you is are you brand safe? If you associate yourself with cannabis mm -hmm. or YouTube or alcohol, party, drugs, whatever that thing, that thing out there, brand will usually hesitate to give you money to make their content. Because uh, why now all the brand, because my company actually coach brand how to work with creators, they are really safe at this point. They know how to work with influencer and micro influencer. And yes, you can sell, you can, you can have 5,000 Instagram followers start selling to a brand and ask them for money, they will give it to you if you are brand safe. If you are 5,000 followers, they are like really niche focus and they really into you. But you can have people like PewDiePie or whatnot, like have bajillion million followers, but, but if you can say one thing wrong, you ruin yourself. So if you try to build your personal brand, we're not talking, not talking about brand, they're talking about like a company brand, right? If you wanna build your personal brand, next time when you take your Instagram story, think twice. Post your Instagram uh, video on IGTV, think twice. Try to make yourself brand safe and try to really organize your content as a brand and what brand think. And that will, will help you to pitch to brand easier later, ask for money. Well, here's an example. We got a guy named Stoner Rob and Medicinal Mike. Now these guys are IG, YouTube. Now they're not on there smoking. You know, they're talking about it. They're going around. So it was very easy for me to take one of these guys or both of them and say, all right, I'm going to go to these brands that make a CBD for children or or something for vets or whatever. Vet, not not animals. Although there is animals, but for vet military vets, and have them sit there and do a face. You know. Hi, I'm such and such and such. I'm at the blah, blah, blah. We represent you know, this brand, and this is what's happening. I mean, that seems authentic. Yeah. Um, they're in that part of that community, yeah. and people respect them. A and we got them from their, their IG. You know, literally, just like, oh, OK, yeah, these guys are nice. authentic. And then seeing them at festivals. But yeah, so it just depends on yeah. what lane on the brand. niche you're in. Yeah. Yeah. Depends on the brand, depends on the audience the brand is trying to, yeah. to mm -hmm. reach. Because if it's a younger audience, younger audiences are more forgiving and they also, again, they still want to be, it's, it's that authenticity. If that's not who you, how you live your life, but you're just, you know, it's super sanitized, then the audience that they're gonna try and reach, they're just gonna be like, I don't care about this person. They're not living, they're not real, you know? Yeah. So there, there's that part of it too. Yeah, I mean, there there's a market for everything. Mm -hmm. Porn sites have ads on them, you know? <laughs> Not that I know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, talking about brand and social media, so one of the big, one of the funnels that helps build brands is social media and how to engage. So you know when you're built when you're building out your 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 platform, your your message out there, your video your video content, you need to you know one of the m most important things you can do is is start engaging different social medias like Instagram and other social media platforms. And so how do you engage those people to build your brand, build your market share, to build more interest in what you do so that you can get all that AVOD and SVOD and TVOD money? You pay them. You pay, well, is that's one way. There's one Create way. Create good content, <laughs> I think that's probably where it I, starts. I mean, incentives is definitely one way, but there's also non-payment non incentives by engaging them through things like contests, through engaging them by yeah. them being involved in the message. Yeah. You know, if, if, if I like Kevin Hart, I want to be a part of Kevin Hart's crew. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go onto social media, I'm going to my Instagram, and I'm going to be part of stuff. So how do, you, how do you use the social media to build, you know, how do you do that? What are some of the ways you can do it? Paying people is one way, but there's some other ways too. Well, for American Idol, we do online editions, and you can, help me on this, JR, you can audition through Musical.ly. Musically, you can you can you can audition on, online, and so uh, all their friends are seeing them audition because you have to post, you have to hashtag it, and right. so the, yeah, it's organic. And then hey, you can win a spot on American Idol. People are trying to create virality, which is kind of oxymoronic. Mm -hmm. So so I mean, the the, the in in the content and in your distribution and in your platform by creating the opportunities for people to chat, for people to have polling, for people to have e-commerce and things like that, 
I mean, you don't want to get crazy. We were working with one of the studios who wanted to create a whole bunch of emoji keyboards for the four people on Earth that were ever going to use emoji keyboards. Mm -hmm. And it was going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so you can go all the way to the side where the product people get crazy, mm -hmm. right? right? Or you can get down to say, okay, people want to chat about what they're seeing. They want to be, they want to have polling. There can be some reward-based systems or things like that. And, and you just need to make the whole concept as frictionless as possible. Right. I mean, uh, for us, a lot of it is is again talking to your audience, but not always just come subscribe. It's actually talking to the audience. So um, we've been doing takeovers with Instagrams, and that's been doing very well for us. So in particular, um, we had a musician who uh, she is very like very much on social herself, but we noticed that she's never done really an uh, AMA, which is Ask Me Anything. And so we said, okay, so during your takeover, she was releasing an exclusive music video. You could only find it on Reverie. So she's already directing her audience to the service, but now it was about being able to actually engage that audience and have them you know, be a part of the conversation through an Ask Me Anything. And that, that was something that, again, it was something she hadn't done to really engage with her fans before, but it was an opportunity for them to not only learn about the platform, but to learn about the platform through someone that they trusted. I want to say, uh, as an individual creator, if you are in the space, you have something to offer, it's very unique. And don't think that you're too small, you're too shy, you have something that brand want. So my suggestion is just go ahead, like send them a message on Instagram, Facebook, whatnot, say, let's collab. Don't talk about money, let's make things together. And you'll be surprised, like bigger brand would love that, they'd love to collab with you. It, it, it just, it's, it's like there's, there's the traditional Hollywood world, like everything's about money. You need to like pay to, to talk to that next guy or next guy, next guy. And, and one thing I love about social media is you can literally reach to the head of the marketing of some company and then just say, yo, let's collab. I have something that you don't have. First, know about yourself, know your worth, know about what you specialize in, and then offer them something and see if they take it. If they don't take it, they're not the right partner for you. So maybe move on to the next one. There are so many brands out there want your knowledge, your creativity. So just keep on doing and just keep reaching out. And I think it's good, like your office perspective, because my head's kind of in the wrong place where I've been dealing with a lot of macro influencers who are just like, pay me, pay me, pay me, you know? And it's a good point. It's like, those deals are gonna run out pretty soon, you know? And it's gonna be about yeah, creators like yourself. Right. So um, there's a lot of different distribution ways to do. And so a lot of people are saying, well, you know, should I sign an exclusive distribution contract with this platform or should I go, sh should I spread myself out? Uh, what are some of the, what are some of the pros and cons of, diff of those different models? When we launched Stadium, which uh, was at that point in time and still is the, the biggest live sports streaming app in the United States, we gave an exclusive to Apple for the first month. And so we didn't launch on Android. And they promoted us all over um, the App Store. Mm -hmm. And it drove unbelievable amount of installs. And so there's an advantage to that, right? If we're about to launch um, a whole bunch of subscription services in China with China Mobile. And so they have 870 million subscribers. So if the denominator is something like that, then, and, and they're willing to lean in and promote your product. But short of that, exclusivity generally doesn't work. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I agree. Yeah. A consensus. What? I said a consensus. A yeah, consensus, <laughs> okay. So, um, okay, so what are, and, and what are some uh, uh, newer distribution models that are coming out? I know, you know, Ty, your, your, your network is kind of a new way of looking at things, and, but, we also have some other uh, other people in, distribu in different distribution channels on, on it. So what are some newer distribution models that are coming out these days that can help people? I think every content provider, whether you are an individual entity um, from creating your Sony or your iPhone content and you go, and you go edit it, uh, edit it before you put it up, make sure you have your brand on there and some whatever platform you put it on, make sure there's a link to old-fashioned web page or something where human beings can buy something. They can actually, you know, buy. Yes, I'm, I am, I'm, Google is wonderful. It does great things with search and whatnot, but I'm much longer on Amazon. As long as human beings want to buy physical stuff, um, I think all, I look at all content as just a store. 
to buy stuff. Yeah, I just want you to watch more content. Um, <laughs> um, but so if it's on digital and I'm looking at CPMs, uh, those dollars or pennies can be quite small. And on broadcast, you know, you can have a higher CPM and make a lot more money. Um, you know, $25, $35, $50 CPMs on broadcast. For now. Right. Um, yeah. at the, the or have a super niche shop. Yes. Community, because I'm um, on digital and I'm getting good CPMs too. Um, <laughs> um, Madison Avenue is still spending lots of, lots and lots and lots of money on TV. Um, um, so I don't know, there's this thread going out, digital is going to kill TV. I was like, oh, okay. They're trying to figure it out. You, you keep your proof of stake CPM model of programmatically getting your dollars on what you're doing, and I'll take my upfronts all day long. Yeah, I mean, Twitch is working for, for Twitch. the right audience. It's mm -hmm. really working. People are cashing checks mm -hmm. on Twitch. Yeah. Um, I agree with you on Amazon. The mm -hmm. problem is is the fact that Amazon, it's never it'll never be your user. It's always their user. Yeah. Correct. You will, you will know literally nothing about them. Correct. You lose your interface. There's no UX UI, right? You've got to fit into the same number of boxes that Showtime and HBO and everybody else falls into, mm -hmm. and it's revenue crack because you will get Absolutely. addicted to the 50 cent dollars that they give you, and then you'll turn around, and this has happened to a whole bunch of vertical guys, because what Amazon understands is, oh, anime is working, right? So I'm just gonna go out and I'm gonna buy all of the anime and spend you more out. than you could ever do, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Under Amazon anime, anime, uh, anime. And, and or the Korean dramas and, and, and drama fever shuts down in one day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so again, good money, but it's, it's scary. But I, I would say though, I believe it was Amazon that, that they did try and do exactly that for the anime to try and compete with Crunchyroll. And Crunchyroll is still here and still strong and still kicking. Mm. And I think a lot of that has to do with their community. Yeah. They, they built that community first. Yeah. So when Amazon did it, everyone saw it was just a money play. So, so there's that to that. But I, I think the community has to, it depends on the yes. community. That's actually really good, good like, feedback because I am on the front end of the anime. I'm Asian, obviously. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, cosplay too. Uh, so yeah, uh, actually, I'm really agree with that. It depends on like your brand and your audience. They they are loyal to you. And if you are build a really loyal audience, like as an individual, as a brand, they will not just like let go of you and go for something like better or cheaper. So really important to spend time and money to communicate, study your audience, be their friends as a brand or as an individual, just talk to them. And, and that is really, really important. People, loyal people come to see you, it's because of you, not because of sometimes you think you offer, most of the time you think you offer, but most sometimes it just, they wanna see you, they wanna just be your friend. So I think that's very important. And other thing is, not because I'm in VR, I wanna to try to offer like different way to distribute your content, but there's a VR out there, mm -hmm. there's an AR out there, there's an XR, the MR. Mm -hmm. If you got in Adobe Max, uh, mm -hmm. you know that this was blowing up. It's mm -hmm. gonna get bigger. Oculus Quest gonna re release like next next month, and and that's HD fine. Gonna release like Vive Focus. HTC. There's there's there, mm -hmm. there's there, and it's still a really niche audience who blow up. Like take my word for it next year because big platforms big, spend big money like google i know google spend a lot of money on it facebook jump on it if you gotta scroll your facebook wall you see the facebook 3d picture is getting a thing now and everybody have their 3d picture and very soon camera can allow you to take like a high resolution 3d picture mm -hmm. and then 3d can become a library to distribute content <laughs> then what about 3d come back from from three years now 3d is dead but now it's coming back you're right. I was an investor in 2014 in a, in a, in a VR company that is doing well before the Oculus thing. Yeah. And right now, VR, I'm sorry, 3D content is making a huge comeback. comeback. I ran into a company recently that we're looking at possibly investing in. They're doing 3D content on cell phones without yeah. glasses, mm -hmm. which you can actually see. And yeah. all it requires is just being shot minimally in 2K. <laughs> and you can yeah. easily turn any piece of content into 3D. And you can sit there and watch it. I've watched yeah, a couple of movies on it, and I was very surprised. Yeah, look, look for a platform that is not popular, not YouTube, Facebook, or anything. Look there, and 
if you see the pie small, jump in, make some content, see if it's stuck. And on. also widen your aperture a little bit, right? Everyone's focused on the on the one eighth of the world that lives in the fifty states, and so yep. the seven eighths that <laughs> are outside, outside yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, take a look at Nigeria, China, which is almost yes. as big. Right? Take a look at Indonesia. Take a look at at, at some of these places. Yeah. Take a look at India, India. with a bill, oh, way over a billion. Africa's got a billion one, a billion two yeah. people. Yeah. I mean, yeah, CPMs are lower, and payment platforms are more challenged because you can't charge monthly subscriptions when people are paid daily wages. There's a whole bunch of complications, but widen the aperture a lot. It's 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 much easier to compete in Nigeria, where Facebook and Google don't take out, uh, and Netflix and and everybody else don't take out most of the money in the marketplace. Yeah. So that's an We're looking at a Nollywood play. Right now, yeah. uh, and in, in Africa, well, in Nali, in Nigeria. in most sub-Saharan African countries, mm -hmm. individuals use their payments on their phones, mm -hmm. and so if you if it's just fractional pieces of pennies, and you have hundreds of thousands of people yeah. doing it, it's a way to, you know, it's a great marketing play, and then you can hedge that by offering it a S bot or T bot in America. Mm -hmm. If you want audience, yeah, I well, highly recommend look into China market and oh, India yeah. market. Yeah. Like yeah. Shane Austin, super smart. Uh, he saw this coming. Uh, I'm not not Shane Austin, uh, some other YouTuber, but he saw this coming. Localized all his content in in Hindi and mm -hmm. launch in India. Mm -hmm. He gained like million million subs subscriber in less than a month. So so like see the future. Try be the guy to look at the trend, but the not one. the trend, but Thank the you. trend before the trend. So you can catch the trend right in. Yeah. So, so Gary V has someone in house who takes all of his content and translates it and like actually kind of recuts it a little for the culture in yeah. several markets all over the world. So I think that'll be a new position that'll spring up in a lot of companies. So, so yeah. talking about uh, phones and these are all devices. You know, our what we used to call a television is actually not a, a device. An iPad or, or any of those things are devices. There, we don't have any TVs anymore. We have devices and. Now the devices are all linked together. So we have a flight phone. We have an app on the phone that uh, that is also on our, also on our on our on our big on our big device mm -hmm. and on our medium sized device. Mm -hmm. So we're tying those all in together. So what are some, and you know, I mean, there's been some very successful things. Like when we worked with Sons of Anarchy, we helped develop their second screen app, and you know, the lead character Jax wears these sunglasses, and we sold. Uh, uh, 890,000 pairs of sunglasses in the, in, in the two seasons that they used it. And the, the mother had this dual necklace. They sold millions and millions of dollars of, of these silly necklaces. Um, that, hold, uh, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. The glasses can't be cool for the guy and the women wearing the necklaces can't be silly. <laughs> they were, they were, the, glasses were, the glasses were cool, and the, and, and the necklaces were. And the were, necklaces were cool, too. Necla necklaces was cool, very cool, I'm sorry. I have sisters. The necklaces were cool, too. Uh, especially, especially, especially the diamond yes. ones that were, that, the, the ones that were diamond, the ones that were glass, I thought was, I don't know. But. Uh, <laughs> Just let it go. <laughs> let it go. So um, what are some ways that you're seeing in, in, in second screen technology and in tying apps to, in, in these, different devices that we have together. So what are you guys doing with that? Uh, I mean, uh, I think American Idol has been doing it the longest and most successfully forever with voting on on the uh, second screen app. Um, uh, more people vote on that app for American Idol than the president. So I'd say that engagement is pretty high. I mean, for us, we're a content business, so it's paying attention to the types of content that we're distributing. We have a lot of short form because a lot of our audience watches on mobile, and it makes more sense. It's easier di easier to digest. We recently just released a series on Instagram, and we have a few other series that we're releasing on Instagram. Just one, to engage in a different way with our content and engage with our community in a different way, but also, again, shorter form content for us, it works better on mobile. So obviously, you're a social media platform. You're not look well, I mean, you might be looking at your Instagram on your TV, but nine times out of 10, you're probably looking at it on your phone. So really just being cognizant with regards to the type of content that we're distributing and where we're distributing it and finding new ways to have our content engage with our community. On the beauty space, on the beauty space, we, we are doing, um, giving brands the ability during the shows to actually sell or pre-sell their items that people are looking at right there on the fly. That's a huge user engagement mm -hmm. we've been we've seen um, recently. Um, shocking. People buy you know buy what you they want what they see yeah. immediately. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've seen a lot of other um, implementations of second screen and there's been some 
I guess one experience meets all second screen apps. I remember one, I think it was called Whip Clip that was around three years ago that allowed you to chop and share moments of pretty much any broadcast show on the fly from your phone. Um, and that lasted, I think, a year or two, and I haven't heard about it since. Um, the things that I'm seeing work are, it's like what he said, it's a dedicated experience for a specific app. Um, yeah. And I think that we'll see more of it. It's just really expensive to do because you're having to build this custom second screen experience for this very specific audience that wants this certain set of engagement tools. Um, so I, I think it's just, it's gonna take a while, but over the next five years, second screen is going to evolve and be a, a big driver of monetization and shopping and all kinds of there's video a platform, interactions. There's a platform coming out in Q2 called My Choice that will be doing that for any TV show. Literally, a person can buy, watch a TV show, turn on there. Shows you what device. is available. What's available it. right there, watching TV, pull it up. I want those shoes, that shirt, that purse, that mm -hmm. hat, right there on the fly. Um, and for content providers, that's going to create a huge boom mm -hmm. for them because now they have a piece of additional revenue, even though they're not the seller of the actual thing themselves. I, I think it'll be more integrated into branded experiences versus a third-party application, but maybe maybe I'm wrong. I think like you're going to be inside of AMC and you're going to have the mobile app. You're going to walk into your living room. It's automatically going to show up on your TV and you're going to be able to start purchasing and engaging through mm -hmm. the AMC app that's on your phone. But yeah, uh, it's just a good general idea. Like, uh, so there's a lot of screen, not a second screen, like the VR is so many screen too. So to me is go look at your budget. So first when you do pre-production, always have budget saved for all those extra screen. So mm -hmm. when you launch your main piece, at least I, I don't know the traditional TV world, but I know the VR world really well. Uh, so if you create a VR piece, your VR piece is not gonna sell because people need a VR headset to watch it. And what gonna sell to the brand like Coca-Cola is your behind the scene. So you always gotta hire a 2D videographer just there, film everything. And also, we use your content. Like, have creative way to reuse your content. A piece of TV show, you can cut it down into like IGTV style, yeah. vertical style, and can reuse it. On VR, uh, you can morph like VR 360 into tiny planet and share it on Instagram. There's a many creative way you can reuse your content and don't just like think one platform. Think about a project, and the project can lead one anywhere. Yeah. And I think it's almost impossible to get someone to download an app right now. It's one of the hardest things you can do. So as a second screen experience, there are companies that will take a fire hose into Twitter. So you could have them call out a hashtag, whatever, and it'll aggregate in real time. So it's, it's less prohibitive for anyone to use second screen like that. Very cool. OK, so we have about 15 minutes. Um, uh, so again, I wanted to thank everybody for being in the audience and coming to here and, and, and listening to our conversation. I wanted to open it up to maybe some questions you guys have for our panelists. So you have some questions, sir. Yeah, there was some uh, background that I didn't understand this whole thing, and it pissed me off. Um, OK. <laughs> SVOD, AVOD, TVOD, search metadata. You got some of these words around, and I'm going like, a AVOD stands for Advertising Video On Demand. Okay. So when you are watching a show and that you can, can, you can purchase or choose to watch, it will have advertising in the actual video while you're watching it. S Video On Demand is subscription video on demand yeah, yeah. Yep. like Netflix or most entities. T Video On Demand is transaction video on demand when you want to watch a particular show independent of watching everything else that maybe in that platform. Like iTunes, yep. like just purchasing yes. a third, like a rental for 24 hours. Yeah. Yes. yes. Metadata, you wanna? So metadata is the data about your data. So for instance, if you go on to, if you go on to Netflix, if you go on to, Netflix, you go on to that's what that's it means. That's accurate, yeah, you're That's right. exactly what it means. So yes. if you go on to Amazon, and you're watching a video, and you stop to pause the video, and all of a sudden, all the actors that are on that scene are coming up, and they have all their bios, that information has to be inputted in there. And metadata is becoming, uh, as, as, our, as our panelists says, metadata is becoming the most, one of the most imperative things that you're gonna need to add. Because if you're gonna, if you're, if you're gonna need to get your video out there, people wanna search for your video, if you don't know who all the actors are, who, you know, where there was things, where, they, where there's shot, information ab about every scene in your video, your video is worth less and less and less. And yeah. Yeah. companies like Netflix are actually saying, in the future, we won't buy your video 
unless you have proper metadata on there. So you know we have we deal with production companies. I have a one my one that does an advert that does, does advert that shoots advertising videos. They've been doing it for 15 years. They shoot an average of four video four commercials a month. Each commercial has three cameras. That's month after month after month for the 15 years. They have a client comes in and says, "Hey, uh, six years ago you shot this this, this video, camera three, and it was starring George Clooney and he was sitting in a tree." Can you go find that for me right now? Well, right. if you have metadata, mm -hmm. you type yeah. George Cloney, tree, camera three, boom, bang, bang, it pulls it all up. So that's a, ba a powerful, powerful tool. So if you need to, if you, and, that, and that will be, make the video be worth more money to the, to, to, to the, to the distribution company. And I think just on that note, Amazon Fire has a good implementation on it. They have like the little X-ray button and you can click X-ray and it shows you at any scene what song or what character is in that scene. And so I, I think it's just gonna be more and more of that. On YouTube, how does that apply for just uploaded videos, simple videos? So uh, metadata is basically your hashtag. So that's actually very important. If you have third party tool like vidIQ, uh, you can look at your video. Explain that to Okay, so uh, okay, so let's think it's a YouTube video, right? Before you upload the YouTube video, you need to input your title, your description, and that's a tag. So tag is basically hashtag, and hashtag basically is your metadata, it's search keyword. That's like SEO stuff, like search engine optimization. So that's what Google used to find your article. You have a blog post, how you find your blog post. On YouTube, it's all that little tag. And that's how YouTube find out how important is your video in this particular topic. And, and when you launch your video, the hashtag you, you're on is a live metadata hashtag. What Google meaning that is, the hashtag will, will interact with the video interaction. What it means is, so people will watch your video, how long they watch it, the duration of the video, they like it, thumb up, thumb down, comment, comment a sentence, comment an article on your comment, like all this generate score on your metadata, that hashtag, that one little word. And then that lead with your video. When it's searching around in the YouTube or Google space, that keyword can either get thumb up, get bump up, or bump down by a competitor. If you're doing really good to promote your video after you launch your video, so your video can share on Reddit, share on Facebook, Twitter, or it make, give you score on this special metadata, with that, your video come up in search. That is a, a kind of general way to explain how search work in, in YouTube. I don't work for Google, so I don't want to lie. But that is, that is at least how I understand the whole thing. And there's a tool to look into that to help you to find problem of your YouTube channel and fix it. And that, that's all changing right now. I, yeah. I have a lot of really smart friends at Google. They've taught computers how to see. So when you upload a video, Google is going to generate hundreds of thousands of keywords for that video automatically as well. Yeah. Do you have one? No, it's just right. Okay. Next question back there. So content creators on the panel and then the folks that are distributing that content, in a world where we have multiple platforms, you can't just distribute one show that hits all the platforms, right? You have to deal with variations, especially Reverie. I'm, I'm curious your your thoughts on this as well. How do you approach that from a pre pro standpoint? Are you So it sort of depends. I mean, from a pre-production standpoint, it's actually in a, a better place for us because we can start right then and there and sort of determine like, okay, what is this, you know, depending on what the content is, like can we create a universe out of it, right? So then it's like, oh, we've got our social and this is how we're gonna hit it from social and this is how we're gonna hit it from our linear side. So on linear, when we because we have linear channels as well on different platforms that are not Reverie specific, but they're not Reverie native, but maybe we, we put them on native in a, on a, in a completely different way. So behind the paywall, you're gonna get everything, you can binge it right away. If you're in AVOD, you're gonna watch one episode at a time. If you're on Instagram, we're gonna have maybe behind the scenes cuts with just the characters to get people excited about the universe. If it's on Twitter, maybe it's a, you know, threads from the character as like, in the, like as though it were a blog, right? And creating it in a way where there's a universe where we can engage the community in different places and as they become super fans of, you know, depending on what the content is and if it allows for this, but you know, as they become super fans of the show itself in that, in that manner, there's different places where they can engage with the content in different ways. 
in terms of distribution, unless you have really deep pockets, what I would probably think about doing is picking a pony first to ride um, and saying, okay, so today, Roku is working for a lot of people. I mean, if you ask people where they're getting most of their viewership and a lot of their monetization, it's on Roku. And so I'm gonna spend $10,000 building a Roku application. If you're outside the United States, then I would build Android before I build iOS in most cases because Android actually. So I unless you have a couple of hundred thousand dollars again to build for iOS and Android and Roku and Chromecast and Apple TV and everybody else, based on the, the, the content, um, I'd pick a horse, get a little bit of money, bet a second horse and a third horse. Yeah, I would pick definitely pick Roku first. Definitely Roku Absolutely. first. Absolutely, <laughs> Roku. And, and if you have a little bit of just basic HTML from JavaScript, we have a tech company also, understanding <laughs> you can actually build your own Roku app and spend a little bit of money and get it up there. It's not difficult. You can do it over a weekend, actually. Yeah, it's a Ro Roku Direct. Yeah. You, you bring the, uh, a feed, and it allows you to launch a Roku Direct app pretty quick. The most expensive um, thing you'll pay for is just um, a your, CMS that's hosting the content yeah, and yeah. spitting you out that Amazon, feed. Amazon, yeah, AWS or whatever. Yeah. Um, and and just, just to add on to the, the content for different platforms and endpoints, um, I think that there's two channels. There's OTT, which I look at as you're trying to get viewership and monetize it, and then there's social, which is mm -hmm. your marketing channel which you're using to drive people to your OTT where you're gonna monetize them at a much higher return and sort of get them inside of your walled garden where you're actually collecting data on them and retargeting them at other content. Um, so social content, marketing focused, you're trying to drive someone somewhere else or educate them about something. Mm -hmm. Whereas OTT content, you're building the long form you know, strategy to keep them engaged and and make money off of that. So following up on your question, for us, we look for different social content and seeing um, what's interesting and what's unique, and we'll take a chance on that, like, okay, let's put a little money in that and turn that into something that's broadcast cable, satellite, in the US, and external, maybe OTT or something else outside the United States worthy, where, um, yeah, we source a lot of our content. It's, it's easy, it's cheap, it's like, that works. Even if it doesn't have the most numbers, I'm like, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the most interesting things I've heard all day. There's no barrier to entry to start a Roku channel. Don't go start an Instagram channel. Go start a Roku channel. <laughs> but I think what you were asking that was actual content production. You know, we, a lot of times we end up with shows from, we just have straight TV shows. We have to put them all on all platforms, right? Is that what you were kind of talking about? So I, I say shoot it super long, shoot it long, shoot as much footage as you can, some practical advice, and shoot it wide when you go to cut down for all those verticals and squares. Yeah, and the other thing is length you need to think about. So um, as you're distributing content, especially in an ad model, uh, two minute video is generally non-monetizable because people are not gonna sit through two 30 second pre-rolls, there's no min-roll, and so, right, and it's just gonna piss off viewers. So, like 50-50 so, ratio. Yeah, exactly, to, exactly. To I mean, content. in China, they watch five minutes of, of commercials before one minute of, of content, but that's kind of an anomaly. It's really, think about five minutes or longer, and I realize that stretches, like, the concept of short form, but, you know, who need to think about Unless VR. Yeah. yeah. VR, you can do two minutes. Uh, just a t attack on the same question. Also think about your content. Uh, in Google, we separate content of three types. as a hero, help, and hub. So help content is tutorial. Like tutorial can be short tips, and then hub can be a community-driven content, longer form, IGTV, and then it's a hero content, then where you make your money. So you should always try to put out help content, and then hub content once a week, and then spend the money on the hero content, and hero content should try to put it behind a paywall and get brand buy in. Mm -hmm. So, so now you have a good category to sell to brand. Very cool. Yes. Next question. One last question for me, spare. How? Yes. Or who? How? How? I actually hold. Hold. <laughs> I'm a hold. Yeah. I won't go there. But wait, uh, uh, I want. 
isn't that it right there? You mean the Sony oh, camera? Yeah. I thought you liked a lot. Oh, I have a lot of cameras, so on my yeah, channel. A7R, right? no, the Z cam. Oh, uh, okay. So A7, that camera, right? that camera is not out yet. It's called yeah. Z cam, Z cam, E two. It's E letter E two. Letter E. Z is zebra. Z cam. C A M. Yeah, E two. Thank you. Yeah, that camera. Yeah, yeah kind of changed the industry. Right. Yeah, and the black magic pocket, which. Came out already. Yes. Okay. Well, um, I'd like to thank all of you again for coming to this uh, panel and being a part of this. If you have any questions, uh, uh, we'll stay around a little bit to answer questions. Uh, again, my name is Jeff Stansfield from Advantage Video Systems and iLaunch TV. And again, if you want to go to NAB, we have free NAB passes for everybody. Um, and we'd love to see you and talk with you about whatever projects you have. Thank you very much. And thanks to my panels. Thanks to my panel.